Do you like my little Halloween setup? <laughs> I've accumulated a collection of little guys. And I finally acquired my lifelong dream, peanut butter and jelly Tutter. I am a mouse! Tutter the mouse! <laughs> He's going to be a permanent fixture in every single one of my videos, so get used to him. So people have been celebrating Halloween as a fun holiday for hundreds of years now, but what did Halloween parties used to look like? What sort of traditions did they have? What foods did they make? What did they wear? I want to take us on a journey back in time today to mostly the 1910s and 20s in the US to catch a glimpse of what a Halloween party back then would have been like. And just for fun, let's try out a few things while we're at it. <laughs> Denison's Bogey Book, Suggestions for Halloween Parties, wrote in 1917, the essentials for a successful Halloween party are a number of jolly young people brought together, an air of mystery pervading the gathering space, some good things to eat, and a leader who knows the time-honored games of fate. It would not be Halloween if we did not pull the telltale plant of kale, look over our shoulder into a mirror for the faces of our sweethearts, and listen breathlessly to our fortunes being told by some beguiling witch." That quote honestly sums it up. People used to approach the entire concept of Halloween very differently from how we do today. Today it's like, how scary and gory can we get? How can we continue to push the boundaries of our fears? But in the early 1900s, Halloween borrowed much more from the late Victorian ideas of the holiday. It focused a lot more on whimsy, spookiness, harvest time in nature, and of course, fortune telling. Halloween decorations were less commonly mass produced, so it was more encouraged for people to not only make costumes from hand, but to also handcraft all of their decorations, usually taking advantage of materials that you could find outdoors or or in your own home. I live in LA, so <laughs> finding autumnal decor outside is definitely not an option unless I want to go drag some palm fronds indoors, or a cactus, or roadkill. But I did manage to find some vintage style decor anyways. For guidance on how a Halloween party should be run, party organizers and hostesses would have referenced any number of extremely popular common household magazines of the time. Godey's Ladies Book, Ladies Home Journal, Harper's Bazaar, The Delineator, Women's Home Companion, Vogue, Time, The Modern Priscilla, or the party planning publications, The Bogey Books. These books gave tips and guides on everything from decorations, food, and invitations, to costumes, etiquette, and games. So you want to throw a Halloween party in the early 1900s. Your first step would probably be to send out invite postcards to your guests. These postcards didn't change much in style or format since the Victorian era. They often featured whimsical illustrations and a poem. Vegetable people were clearly a fan favorite for holiday postcards in general because there's a lot of these and they are bewildering. <laughs> the 1912 bogey book warned, the invitations should contain as much secrecy and excite as great curiosity as possible. Everyone loves mystery and the Halloween party, shrouded from the beginning, will be the most successful. This suggestion from the 1914 pictorial review is one of my favorites. Decorate the invitations with queer little imps stenciled in gay colors on white paper or cardboard. Enclose within each invitation a red maple leaf and the yellow one. These are cut from paper and require no pattern save that which may be made by tracing around a real maple leaf. On each leaf, print the name of the person to whom the invitation goes with these directions. We herewith make sincere request that you will deem to be our guest. On Halloween at hour of eight, pray don't be formal, don't be late. As the autumn breezes gaily blow, let the maple imps your fortune show. If you cannot come, which would give us grief, please return to us the yellow leaf. But if you can come, much joy you'll shed by sending us promptly the leaf that's red. Uh, yeah, if I get a card in the mail covered in queer little imps stenciled in gay colors, I will be returning the red leaf and absolutely fucking it up at that party. Here's another fun one. You are commanded to attend our Halloween festivities, whereat you will be expected to exert yourself at utmost to promote ghostly interests. Baby, I promote ghostly interests every day when I wake up and instantly feel another one of my internal organs shutting down. This is not going to be an issue. I don't know what the kids are doing these days, but I distinctly remember a very similar thing to these postcards happening when I was a kid living in Texas. Like, sometimes anonymous people would drop off like a goodie bag on your doorstep which contained a spooky poem about how you had to now pass along the poem to someone else with a goodie bag or you'll be cursed. Was this unique to where I lived? I don't know. Tell me in the comments if you too were attacked by threatening Halloween goodie bags. <laughs> Okay, I only just remembered this as I was editing. 
They're called boo bags. And no, they're not unique to my experience. They're extremely common. <laughs> I don't know, this, this buried memory just emerged out of nowhere. Thank you. They're called boo bags. <laughs> so after you've got your RSVP list set, it's time to decorate. And as I said earlier, most decor was handmade or brought in from outside. People got really creative though, like this prank from 1907 where a weighted paper mache snake drops down on guests as they walk in. It was common for people to transform their laundry rooms, for instance, into a fun setting like this pirate's den from 1922. Overall, holding the party in a barn if you had one was the most popular. Of course, you had the classics in the way of decorations, using crepe paper, creepy paper, it's crepe paper, carving jack-o'-lanterns, utilizing candles, dressed up dummies and scarecrows, streamers, and paper mache sculpted skeletons. But many of these hostess articles also encouraged using nature, scattering leaves around or utilizing dead branches, using autumn harvest produce as centerpieces, setting up corn stalks, generally hanging out in barns, lots and lots of pumpkins. And obviously you got to have party favors, popcorn balls, lollipops, noisemakers, and little handmade crafts all placed in very creative packaging. I imagine it probably got competitive to see who could make the most memorable party favors. After all, they were often at least partially some type of thing that could be saved as a souvenir in a scrapbook. Arguably, the most important part of these parties was fortune-telling games and superstitions, which were branched off from old Irish, Scottish, and English folk traditions and beliefs. Unsurprisingly, these fortune-telling games were usually about trying to foresee your future lover, in part because these Halloween parties were a rare opportunity for young people to flirt with each other in a proper setting. There were usually chaperones, and odds are you and the other people attending the party were in the same social circle, not to mention class. While social expectations between men and women were loosening up considerably by the tens, it was still a decade clinging to the remnants of the Victorian etiquette rules. Etiquette manuals, like we discussed in my video about sexy ankles, were still very much a staple for women of middle and upper class households, and they had a lot to say about how to act at a party. Don't let any man touch the tip of your little finger until he has the right. You'll be glad you didn't when the right man appears. If that one in any innuendo or dead serious, I literally can't tell. <laughs> but fortune telling was also done in the form of games, much in the same way that people in more recent years use Ouija boards or play Bloody Mary. One game that was a good way for people to flirt with each other under the guise of fortune telling was apple pairing. Harper's Bazaar described in 1907, there was much merriment over the whirling stick. Upon one end of this, an apple was impaled. Upon the other stood an ignited candle. A string was attached near the apple, and the stick suspended from the ceiling, balanced so that it hung horizontally. It was then set whirling, and players, hands still bound behind, were given a few minutes to try and try for a bite out of the apple's fat cheek. Around and around whirled the stick so rapidly that the candle flame brushed noses and chins in the sauciest manner. The love divination aspect of the game was cemented later, as evidenced by poems like these from the 20s and 30s. Pair an apple, take the skin, and fling it straight behind behind you. Whatever letter it may frame, that will begin your true love's name, and they will surely find you. With a sharp knife, pair an apple, round and round and round. Toss the pairing o'er your shoulder, the initial found, will be of the one you'll marry. Do not be afraid. Tis an old prophetic omen, good for man or maid. Another apple-based game was Snap Apple, where apples were suspended by strings from the ceiling or a door frame, and people competed to see who could bite one first with their hands tied behind their backs. The one who wins would be the first to marry. The fixation on apples here is related to the long history of symbolism where apples represent love and fertility. As the 1908 edition of the Mother's Magazine said, Halloween shows us the sunny side of the superstitious life, and its present observance tells what it was 50 years ago, for we hold to the shadows of what was real to the people then. It was in some way associated in the olden time with the love interest of the young. It seems to have been a sweetheart festival more than anything else. All the traditional experiments were made to find out which two young people belonged to each other. But like, don't get it twisted. Usually people were not taking the fortune telling stuff very seriously. In fact, a lot of magazines from the time complained about how no intelligent person truly believes in fortune telling. I, on the other hand, take it very seriously. So let's try out some old timey fortune telling games. The first game is from today's magazine of October 15th, 1910. 
It reads, Another way of learning one's fate is by the test of the three saucers, one of which contains milk and one water, the other being left empty. These are placed on a table and the persons trying their fate are blindfolded. If they dip their fingers in the milk, they will achieve wealth. And if in the water, only a comfortable competency will be theirs. And if into the empty saucer, poverty awaits them. So of course I set up the milk, the water, and the empty saucer, and I blindfolded myself had a very hard time finding the dish, but ended up touching the oat milk dish. So I guess that means that wealth awaits me, which is really convenient because I found $2 in my butt pocket approximately five minutes after this. <laughs> the next game is from Halloween Fun of 1927. It reads, a young lady is given a dozen kernels of popcorn in a wire popper. These are to be popped over the coals. The number of kernels remaining unpopped foretell the number of years before she is to marry. Well, I don't have any loose popcorn, but I do have a bag of popcorn, so I let that pop and then counted out how many kernels were left. Four kernels. So, um... If any ladies want to send me in a girlfriend application, I guess you better get in soon because four years is the time limit. Yeah, yeah, so we figured out our fortunes, that's nice. But what about the food? So bad news. It's not great. But first, the table settings. Probably the most famous Halloween table element of this era is the Jack Horner pie, named after the little Jack Horner nursery rhyme, which is not only not usually a pie, but not even the same thing across the board. It's more like a category. It was basically a centerpiece where you had to be visually creative and craft a Halloween themed container that is hiding little treasures or prizes attached to strings leading to each place at the table and each guest can pull the strings to claim a prize. Following the fortune telling games you also had fortune telling food like walnuts that contain fortunes. The fortunes said things like for fame and fortune you'll have to fight. Don't lose courage. Twill end all right. Aw. Or, you are fickle, and tis said, you'll often love, but never wed. Oh. We have to talk about the food now. Some of it isn't that bad. You've got, you know, ice fruit juice, fruit salad. If your party's more of a sit-down affair, you might even have a whole menu. But usually the more casual fare was weird sandwiches. <laughs> and by weird, I mean completely normal for this time period. For example, you've got chopped ham with currant jelly cream cheese with guava jelly and pecans, olive with mayo and caviar, Neufchatel cheese mixed with salad dressing and olives, raisins and marmalade. <laughs> yeah, okay, moving on. The side dishes and sweets were usually better off except for the recipe for literally just burnt almonds for dessert in the 1907 pictorial review. But it wasn't all bad. Honestly, a lot of the full menus these magazines suggested were not bad. Like, if you put little tea sandwiches and orange sherbet in front of me, like the 1915 Bogies book suggests, I'm not gonna complain at you. Even better, some menus got creative and came up with Halloween-y names for regular foods, like this menu for Midnight Supper for Grown Ups in the 1926 Neilcraft magazine that lists witch's broth and magic wands, which are literally just soup and breadsticks. I just think that's cute and I'm gonna start using it. <laughs> the women's magazine wrote in 1914, the elf salad is apple, nut, and celery salad served in bright red apple shells. Broom straws are cheese straws, and goblin's food consists of brown bread sandwiches with a filling of cream cheese and chopped olives. God, these people love olives. Black cat cream is vanilla ice cream with chopped raisins, nuts, and bits of ginger mixed through with it. Witch's brew is cider, and lucky cakes are plain cookies, while mystic sweets are green and white candies. But of course, you've got to arrive in costume. The tens and twenties saw some really fun costume ideas and some not so fun ones. I was gonna make this one from the 1922 bogeys book for this video, but <sighs> life happened. Sorry, just pretend that I have it on. In 1925, the bogey book wrote, gay costumes are part of every Halloween party. So true. Typically, people would make their own costumes at home by sewing it or following one of many guides to crafting a costume out of crepe paper. Creepy paper. Crepe paper, master? And some people really got into it. Like this story from the housekeeper in 1912. I observed that some of the other guests had ideas as to costumes. For instance, one rather short spirit had drawn her pillowcase into two ears on top of her head and painted on her mask, a piece of white muslin with holes cut in it for eyes and mouth, a full set of whiskers. Occasionally, she emitted a plaintive, 
meow, varied by hisses while she worked her hands like claws. Another wore two masks, one in front and one behind, and it was very difficult to determine whether he was coming or going. As always, Halloween afforded people a rare opportunity to act like children again, and that one thing has never changed, though so many other facets of the way that we celebrate Halloween absolutely have. Maybe the Mother's Magazine sums it all up best. May we never grow out of some of the feelings that have made Halloween. Life is prosaic enough without stripping more of its pleasant fancies away or stealing and slaying its laughter. If only we can draw the borderline sharp and clear and keep on the right side, it will be well to honor all festivals, but pleasure and fair, clean and converse, merriment and chaste behavior are possible and desirable contributions. Keeping them, we can keep Halloween with light and honest hearts. So, wash thy hands, wear thy masks, and go try some old-timey Halloween recipes, as long as it's not burnt almonds. Uh -huh.